The topic of the month for November 2018 is Controlled Flight into Terrain. In this presentation, we'll talk a little bit about controlled flight into terrain, CFIT accidents, and recommendations termed safety enhancements from the General Aviation Joint Steering Committee, a work group that studies general aviation accidents. We'll discuss some safety risk management and technological solutions to CFIT challenges, and finally, we'll give you some tips and tricks that will help you to avoid CFIT accidents. CFIT is defined as an unintentional collision with terrain while an aircraft is under positive control. For this presentation, we looked at a typical year in which we see about 40 CFIT accidents, at least half of which are fatal. It's logical to think that CFIT accidents usually involve inexperienced pilots in dark night and or instrument meteorological conditions. In fact, in a typical year, more than 75% of CFIT accidents occur in daylight, and more than half of those are in visual conditions. As we might expect, the majority of CFIT pilots hold private certificates, but commercial and ATP pilots, as well as flight instructors, are also well represented. You might think that most CFIT pilots are not instrument rated, and that's correct. But in a typical year, more than a third of CFIT pilots hold instrument ratings. Continued VFR into IMC is the deadliest accident precursor. We don't know how often pilots are successful in pursuing the impossible dream. Undoubtedly, some get away safely, but continued VFR into IMC accidents are usually fatal. Of the 41 accidents in our study group, 11, or 25% of the total, were preceded by continued VFR into IMC, and they were all fatal. You'd think that VFR pilots would more often be involved in continued VFR accidents, but they were evenly split in this study group. IFR procedural mistakes account for a significant portion of CFIT accidents each year. Instrument pilots must be sure they're complying with all aspects of the clearances they accept and the procedures they fly. Wire strikes are often cited in CFIT accident reports and they are common in agricultural operations, but more than half of them are not associated with ag flying. It's true that there are some very high towers around, and their support wires can extend well beyond the tower itself, but there are relatively few collisions with tall towers or their support structures. In fact, most wire strikes occur below 200 feet AGL. You've got to wonder, what required the pilots to be that low? especially in the vicinity of wires, and be aware that many wires are unmarked. Give yourself some room. A little extra altitude, even 500 feet, will keep you above 90% of the wires. Some CFIT accidents are caused by unrealistic expectations for aircraft performance. High-density altitude combined with a shorter and or obstructed runway and aircraft at near gross weight have resulted in collisions with obstacles on takeoff. Carburetor or induction system ice can reduce climb performance with the same result. And tailwinds on approach or takeoff can precede CFIT. Finally, we had one pilot incapacitation accident, two intentional collisions with terrain, only one of which was fatal, and two accidents involving U.S. registered aircraft operating abroad. Safety risk management is all about knowing what you're getting into and understanding what capabilities and resources you have that will ensure that each flight is completed safely. SRM begins with a solid pre-flight risk assessment. The assessment considers the pilot, the aircraft, the environment within which the flight will take place, and external pressures that may affect pilot judgment and performance. There are various flight risk assessment tools, or FRATs, available to assist pilots in building their risk assessments. Good pre-flight risk assessments mean you'll have excellent situational awareness when you take off. The trick is to maintain that awareness until you're tied down or in the hangar at your destination. Maintaining situational awareness means you're constantly adjusting your assessments by answering questions such as, is the weather what I expected? Is my ground speed as predicted? 
How long will it be till I get to the next checkpoint or to my destination? What will be my fuel status when I get there? Harder to answer are questions such as, Am I becoming fatigued? Can I continue with my flight as planned, or is it time to adjust my expectations? Am I making my decision solely on the safety of flight, or am I feeling pressure to complete the flight as planned? That brings us to planned continuation bias. You may know it as get there itis. Whatever you call it, it's real and every pilot must learn how to rationally deal with it. This deadly bias will tempt you to delay resorting to Plan B until you've already entered instrument meteorological conditions while trying to maintain VFR. It's also contributed to pilots overflying en route fueling opportunities and running short of fuel at the destination. We'll discuss this in depth in an upcoming topic of the month, but for now, deal with get there itis by having a Plan B and maybe even C and make the decision to go to it before an emergency is in progress. On 29 December 1972, Eastern Airlines Flight 401, Lockheed L-1011, was scheduled to fly from JFK in New York to Miami International Airport in Florida. Three flight crew and one non-revenue company employee were in the cockpit as the flight began the approach to Miami. After extending the landing gear on final approach, the first officer noticed the nose wheel down and locked light was not illuminated. The approach was aborted and the aircraft entered a 2,000-foot holding pattern west of the airport. The crew engaged the autopilot while all four cockpit occupants engaged in troubleshooting the problem. When the autopilot was engaged, it was inadvertently placed in control wheel steering CWS mode. In this mode, the airplane would maintain the altitude last commanded by the pilot. One of the pilots, most likely the captain, bumped the control column as he turned to speak with the flight engineer. The airplane was placed in a shallow descent that was maintained all the way to the ground. Four professional aviators, any one of whom could have detected the descent, were so focused on a non-critical task that they failed to detect and arrest the descent. Autopilots are great at reducing pilot workload, and let's face it, they fly more precisely than we do. But autopilots must be monitored because they will maintain heading and altitude right into the ground if that's what you've asked them to do. Distracted pilots have flown aircraft into terrain without autopilot assistance as well. No matter what you're dealing with, you must fly the aircraft first. Make sure you're always under control, properly configured, and in a safe flight environment. There are a host of technological programs, applications, and devices that can aid pilots in situational awareness and risk assessment. Moving maps with terrain overlays are common, so there's no excuse for not knowing how close you are to a collision. Flight planning tools can now integrate with charting programs, cockpit displays, and weather imagery. FRAT applications make it easy to conduct pre- and in-flight risk assessments, and performance monitoring equipment keep pilots apprised of their aircraft's capability. Pilots have access to more information than ever before, and that has already contributed to a 20-year reduction in CFIT accidents. But all that information comes in many different forms, so pilots must be thoroughly familiar with and proficient in device operation and information interpretation. Successful professionals, no matter what their specialty, rely on coaching to keep them on top of their game. Pilots are no exception. Regular proficiency training with a flight instructor is the best investment you can make in safety and peace of mind. There are a wealth of proficiency training programs available. Of course, we recommend FAA Wings Pilot Proficiency Training, but no matter what program or instructor you choose, please participate in scenario-based training. This holistic approach to proficiency looks at all aspects of safe flight from pre-flight planning to securing the aircraft at the end of the flight. Holistic training reinforces your skill at collectively managing all pilot processes and tasks in realistic scenarios.
You can keep your skills sharp between flights by flying simulators or flight training devices. Many feature realistic graphics so you can get a look at unfamiliar destination environments, and you can practice instrument procedures before you have to fly them for real. But one caution here, simulation is not adequate preparation for flights to unfamiliar challenging if not hostile environments such as mountains, obstructed short runways, and high density altitude environments. For those areas, consult a flight instructor who is thoroughly familiar with the environment. Simulation works well as a solo activity, but it's much better if you have a flight instructor managing the simulator and scenario while you do the flying. Moving Map, Enhanced and Synthetic Vision Technology is now available on installed equipment and handheld devices. Nothing has done more for situational awareness than this technology, but you have to commit to keeping the databases up to date and you must confirm that you're looking at the latest weather imagery. Also, be aware that even the latest weather pictures are not real time, so give a wide berth to any weather you're trying to avoid. And the availability of this technology has given rise to a paradox. Pilots are more situationally aware than ever before but sea fit and weather accidents still occur and pilot deviations continue to rise. Perhaps this is because pilots are more confident in their position, so they fly closer to things they're trying to avoid. Obviously, the solution is to give yourself some breathing room. That means at least a mile from airspace and 2,000 feet vertically from terrain you're trying to avoid. Airspace and terrain don't move much, but weather is very dynamic so greater clearance distances will be required. Now for a quick review. Wire strikes are almost exclusively confined to agricultural operations. Faults. Many wire strikes do occur in agricultural operations, but they occur in en route operations as well. CFIT accidents occur primarily during night conditions. Faults. The majority of CFIT accidents occur during the day. Two thirds of CFIT accidents occur in IMC conditions. Faults. CFIT accidents are almost evenly split between IMC and VMC conditions. The order of priority in performing pilot tasks is A. Communicate, aviate, navigate. B. Aviate, communicate, navigate. Or C. Aviate, navigate, communicate. The correct answer is C. Aviate, navigate, communicate. It's true that all of these things happen at nearly the same time, but your first priority is to fly the airplane, followed by navigating so as to avoid impacting terrain. Once you've got those under control, it's time to communicate your intentions. Good practices to avoid CFIT are A. Manage distractions. B. Seek proficiency training. C. Give yourself some room. D. Use flight risk assessment tools. E. Fly at least 500 AGL to avoid wires. Or F. All of the above. The correct answer is F. All of the above. Please direct any questions to your local FAST team representative. Narration by Bradford Wood, Fast Team National Outreach Manager. There's nothing like the feeling you get when you know you're playing your A game, and in order to do that, you need a good coach. So fly regularly with a CFI who will challenge you to review what you know, explore new horizons, and to always do your best. Of course, you'll have to dedicate time and money to your proficiency program, but it's well worth it for the peace of mind that comes with confidence. Vince Lombardi, the famous football coach, said, Practice does not make perfect. 
Only perfect practice makes perfect. For pilots, that means flying with precision, on course, on altitude, on speed, all the time. And be sure to document your achievement in the Wings Proficiency Program. It's a great way to stay on top of your game and keep your flight review current. Your presence here shows that you are a vital member of our general aviation safety community. The high standards you keep and the examples you set are a great credit to you and to GA. Thank you for attending.